Turn to Genesis 22, and then I'm going to tell this story. Paige had told me that, she had told me what um, she told you when I told her that I was going to say to the church about Graceland possibly having cerebral palsy. We know that God can heal that. God, Jesus, healed the man who was sick of the palsy. And Paige said that, she said, don't pray against it. Now, let me tell you what she means. It's not that we don't want her healed. But Paige has been telling me for a long time, there's something not right with her. Mama knows these things. And asked me to pray for her. And since I really didn't know all that was going on, I would pray for her like I pray for all my family. And when I was told that it was cerebral palsy or possibly that, I lost it. But I thought of a young man that I had known for a long time. His name is Riley. I know his mom and dad. He's, his dad is a fellow pastor. Good man. Love him. Very, it's just a godly man. Him and his wife both. Godly people. They love the Lord. God's been good to them. And they've served faithfully for years. They had several children. Several daughters. And sons. And their youngest child that they were going to have, the doctors told them that they had done some tests in utero and that he was going to be severely, they call it Down syndrome, retarded, retard, retardation, that he had severe Down syndrome, probably would not live too long past birth. They even advised her that it would probably be best if they aborted this baby. It would probably be more humane to abort this baby. Now, I believe the Bible, there is nothing humane about an abortion. Nothing. You are killing something that God said, I want it to live. You see, you think that mamas and daddies make babies. No, God does that. God is the one. I mean, and if you don't believe that, ask yourself the question, with all of the animals and Noah and his three childbearing age sons with their wives how come nobody had no babies on the ark for a year you figured at least one of noah's daughters-in-laws would have come off that ark pregnant eight people went on and the bible says eight people came off so god is the one who gives life and it's not up to us before that child is ever born to have a right to take that life away. And yes, I do believe the Bible tells us that life begins at conception because God said, before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. Who, wait a minute, let me get back to that. Who formed a child in the womb? God did. So they did not abort that baby. And sometimes doctors get it wrong. Riley lived months after his birth. In fact, he lived a year after his birth. In fact, he lived 10 years after his birth. In fact, now I think he's somewhere around 25. He's 25, somewhere around in there, somewhere. He's a young man now. 
Now, he has problems hearing. He's mostly deaf. He wears these big hearing aids. And he does have a severe case of Down syndrome. But did you know that that mom and daddy have trained that boy so well? I've seen him, Brother George, at those camp meetings that we have where the preachers preach for hours. And they, that boy will sit there for hours in a church service and never make a sound. He is the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. And everybody that knows him just takes to him instantly. So that's kind of what she was getting at. God gave, and I thought this years ago, how blessed uh, Charlie and Naomi Jameson were to have this little boy, Riley. How blessed they were to have that child. They're, they're one of the lucky parents in that they get to have a child that never grows up. See, ours grow up, then that's when they start ca causing problems. Amen? But they are fortunate enough to have a child that never grows up. So that's what she meant by that. Or maybe I think that's what she meant by that. She's glad that maybe now that they found out what's going on, there's a treatment. I don't know that there's a cure. But they have a very special little child now. Not too many people get one of those. Genesis chapter 22. I mentioned earlier John 3:16 because we sing, "Whosoever believe, whosoever surely mean with me," was based on John 3:16, "For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life." By the way, to our visitors, I don't let out at 12. Now, why is that funny? I preach the word. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven different verses out of the Bible. You didn't come to hear me. You came to hear the word of God. And I'm going to give you the word of God this morning. But for God to give His only begotten Son to us had to have been hard. But God is God, right? We think God is God and God may not have had a problem with it. Well, now He gives us an example of what it was like. See, God always shows us in the Bible types and shadows, foreshadows of certain doctrines when John 3.16 is mentioned, I automatically think of Genesis 22. Because it says in Genesis 22, if you look in verse 1 and 2, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. See, he's saying thine only son Isaac to attach it 2,000 years later to John 3, 16, God gave His only begotten Son. Take now thine only Son, whom thou lovest. You see, he's his, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He loved Jesus, but He loved us too, didn't He? And He loved us so much that He gave His only begotten Son to us to suffer on a cross and be humiliated and to be strangled for hours on that cross and to be whipped on that cross and to be pierced in His hands and His feet on that cross and the crown of thorns, Him bearing the sins of the entire world on Him. God, they did that 
We did that to God's son. But God loved us so much that he let his son do that. And here's Abram. Abraham. Take now thy son, thy only son, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. He's looking in the future. Because not only the place that he's looking at is Mount Moriah. That's, that's Jerusalem. That's Golgotha. That's Calvary. That's where they crucified Christ. He is looking at the place. Where 2,000 years later, God is going to offer his only begotten son. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Now I have up on the screen now starting, this is where the message is going to start. Verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide here ye with the ass, and, and the lad, and, 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 and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. Can you imagine what Abraham is thinking? By this, if this is me, by this time, I am collapsed. I'm losing it. I'm losing my mind. But I guess God just gives you faith. I guess God gives you faith. We know, we know from the Bible what Abraham was thinking. Even if I plunge the knife into my, my son's chest, which you couldn't pay me $20 billion to put a knife in my son's chest. You couldn't do it. But he's thinking, even if I kill him, God's going to raise him back from the dead. We know that because the Bible tells us that's what he was thinking. God's going to raise him back from the dead because he said it was going to be from Isaac that his seed would be called. And Abraham believed God. God counted unto him for righteousness. See, we're of the seed of Abraham, aren't we? By faith, because we believe what God said. Verse 7, Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And now I'm really, if this is me, I'm on the ground bawling my eyes out. But that's not me. This is Abraham, and Abraham without even... Without his voice even trembling, without him shaking or anything, he said, um, where did I lose it at? Eight, verse 8, God said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And he did. So they went, both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac. His, Gosh, I could not do this. Bound Isaac, his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. He said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. Seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. You listen to this. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and behold him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for burnt offering in the stead of his son. Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. 
And you understand why it's called that, don't you? Because in that exact, and I believe it, it was in that exact spot. I believe that's where Gordon's Calvary is. I believe that's where the place of the skull is. And I believe that's where they put Jesus on that cross. I'm going to be preaching this message to me today. It's about sacrifice. What do we give? What do we offer God? What? And let me say this. this don't think this is all about putting more money in the plate. Because those of you who know me. When have you ever heard me preach on giving money? I don't do it. Now, I will teach every now and then on tithing, biblical tithing. I believe in it. And as a subject, it's my responsibility to teach it. <clears throat> but you're not looking at a preacher who stands up here every Sunday begging you and hitting you up for more money, more money, more money, more money. This, in many ways, may not have anything to do with how much you're giving to the church. This may, for you, have everything to do with what you're doing for someone else in your life. And when it comes to God, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and God's already told us if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. How many fatted calves does God eat a day? In fact, we don't have any record that I'm aware of of anything in the Bible where it says God eats anything. <clears throat> Let's go to prayer. Father, I ask your blessings, Lord, on this message. As I now realize, Father, who it's for. And I pray God should help me to preach it. Right. Let it be true. Let it be a blessing, Lord, to whoever it's supposed to be a blessing to. Lord, maybe this, maybe this message is intended to be a warning to someone. I don't know. If it's intended to be a warning, I pray, Lord, the warning would be heeded. But if nothing else, Father, whoever you warn with this, they're going to stand before you one of these days. And before they'll have a chance to say, I didn't know, you're going to remind them that they heard this message today. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help me today with my emotions. And God, that you would just help me to do a servant's duty today. A faithful steward. And Father, again, I have nothing to give to these people, so we're coming to you as our neighbor. Would you rise and give us bread today? Our journey through life, Lord, is full of surprises. We never know one day to another what's going what's to happen or what you're going to bring our way. And Father, we're hungry. And we need to be fed, so we pray, dear God, you would feed us today. So we ask your blessings on your word, and we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, I, again, I don't know how to answer this question. Could I have been Abraham on that day? Because as I'm reading this today, I'm telling you, I'm, in my mind, I'm picturing myself trying to be Abraham and I'm losing it. I see myself turning around, headed back home. I see myself not even able to put the knife in my hand. I, I, I don't believe Matthew or Caleb that I've ever, or any of the girls, I don't believe I've ever tied you up. Have I? If I ever, Alicia, did I ever tie you up and take you out and say, I'm going to kill you? No, you didn't get the crazy dad that way. I cannot in my mind, I, so I don't know, my, but I cannot right now in my mind imagine myself doing all of these things that Abraham did, but Abraham did every single one of them. But he, he does believe, we know from the Bible, he does believe and know in his mind that even as God is asking him to do this, he knows that even if he has to rip his chest open and he bleeds to death, he knows that his son is going to 
rise back up from the dead and grow up to be a strong young man and marry a wife and give him lots of grandchildren because God promised him that and God does not break his promises. Somebody say amen. So I understand, I understand human nature enough to know that we don't like to give for other people. I understand human nature because I've got one. I've got a human nature that wants to keep and not give, that wants to sit and not do. I've got a human nature like that. I've got a nature that's full of pride that looks at me first and what benefits me first, what satisfies me first, what satisfies my pride, what satisfies my flesh, what satisfies the lust of mine eyes, the lust of my body, the pride of my life. I know human nature enough to know, I know how to satisfy myself. What I have to work on is sacrifice. What I have to work on is doing for others before I do for myself. And, isn't, and, and so in saying that, remember how Jesus divided the sheep from the goats. He, Jesus never, never one time made it about himself and what are you going to do for me? He said, in as much as you've done it to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. That's what Jesus said. He never made it about what you give me. What did you, what did you present to me? How much money did you give me? How many fatty calves did you give me? No. He made it about those who were sick, those who were in prison, those who were destitute, those who needed food, those who needed clothing. He made it about them and he said the very least of them. If you did it to them, you did it to me. Psalm chapter 4, verse 5, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. So let's, let's make this then, since, since we're not going to make it about God, let's, and, or are you thinking that I'm going to try to pull more money out of your pocket or get you to do more for your church? Let's lay it on, let's lay it on this field of, um, let's say, uh, let's say your family. Let's say your neighbors. Do you know what civic responsibility is? Does anybody know what that term means? If you're drunk driving a vehicle, are you practicing good civic responsibility? No, because you decided to drink too much and get behind the wheel of a car. You decided to put everybody else's lives in danger ahead of yourself. See, that, that kind of stuff is what we ought to be teaching to our kids. In fact, they used to in public schools. They used to teach in public schools civic responsibility. That each one of us has a responsibility as Americans to act like Americans. Amen. So that when they bomb Pearl Harbor, we don't have to beg people to go sign up. They went and signed up. They said, that's my country. And I'm going to pay them back. If I have to give my own life, I'm going to pay them back. Y'all remember Buster Montgomery used to come here years ago? He was... 17 years old, grew up on a farm. And he went, he left home as soon as he found out about Pearl Harbor. He left home, went to the Navy recruiting station, said, I promise you, I'm 18 years old. They said, okay, you're 18. He lied about his age. They trained him, they sent him to Pearl Harbor, and the day that he got off the ship at Pearl Harbor, they put a hazmat suit on him and had him digging bodies out of those ships. That's civic responsibility. 
That's the kind of stuff that our young people in this country need to learn instead of burning down neighborhood stores. And flags! And everything else. So let's put it on your responsibility to your country. What did Kennedy say? Ask not what your country could do for you, but ask what you could do. Let me tell you what you could do for your country. Arm yourself. Let me tell you what else you could do for your country. Vote. And then hang around the voting place next time they have a presidential vote. And let's not give them another opportunity to cheat. And all kinds of treasonous acts like that. There's a way that we're supposed to act for the benefit of our own countrymen, is there not? We could put it on that level too. Your neighborhood. Is there anything wrong if you see somebody working the doorknob of your neighbor's house of calling the cops and saying, I'm seeing somebody over my neighbor's house that I don't know those people and I don't know what they're doing there. That's responsibility. What if you hate the neighbor? Call the police. You're the one that's supposed to be the good neighbor. You see, you're to offer the sacrifices of righteousness, which means if you know it's the right thing, you listen to this, if you know it's the right thing to do and you don't do it, you're the one that's wrong. Not the neighbor who smokes pot and who does drugs and all of that stuff. You're the one that's supposed to, if you know to do, what did Paul say? If we know to do right, I'm going to paraphrase it, mess it all up, but if we know to do right and we don't do it to him, it is sin. Your church, sacrifices of righteousness on your church, if you know it's the right thing to do for your church and you don't do it, See, I don't think that coming to church is a big sacrifice. But it is a sacrifice. There are other things you could do. There might be more work that you could get done. But if it's the right thing to do, it's called a sacrifice of righteousness. Because you know it's the right thing to do. And you're going to do it no matter what else. That we were young, Lisa and I were young. Just got married. Out of work. Just to give you an example. Because I don't know everybody's life here or I'd tell stories on you. But she, she said, here's the checkbook. We have enough money to pay the electric bill or we have enough money to pay our tithes for this week. I don't know what to do. You're the man. And I had to think about it. And the Holy Spirit said, pay the tithes. So we paid the tithes. You know what happened after that? We paid the electric bill. Or God did. You see, I'm not, I'm not saying that to boast on myself. I'm telling you that part of me wanted to say, let's pay the electric bill. Got to keep the electric bill on. Part of me wanted to say that. But if you know it, that by doing something, you're doing something that God says is wrong and you do it anyway. You're a sinner. Amen. You're a sinner. 
if you know it's the right thing to do, even if something else is going on, you come to the house of the Lord. I'm preaching this to everybody. Churches all over the country in America are closing down their Wednesday night service and their Sunday night service and their Sunday school. Leaving them with one service. Leaving the pastor now who makes $120,000 a year, all he has to do is preach one sermon that week. You don't know how many times I've been tempted to shut one of our services down. Why would I be tempted to do that? Nobody comes. Now, we've recovered since COVID, have we not? And I'm even okay with you watching it online. That's how... That's how I am. But there's just something about being here that's just, to me, it's better. And after all, it's not a big sacrifice. Sacrifices. Sacrifices is what moms and dads do every day. Am I right, moms and dads? Did you not have to make sacrifices so that your kids could have this and your kids could have that? And God, between the ages of the year I got married to Lisa... And till I was, well, till Matthew was born, are years that I never talk about. I hated those years. I was arrogant, very full of myself, totally unfit to be the man of God behind a pulpit. And I remember telling myself at one time, I will make myself happy no matter what. Now that's, how, that's what I said to myself one day. I was so stupid and pathetic. And God used my children to take a rod after me and beat me so bad and so hard and so far down. My wife, there was nights, I said, Lisa, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. Because it was all about me and what I wanted for me. I wasn't thinking of my wife. I wasn't thinking of my children. I was thinking of nobody except me. What you know of me now, if you like that, I guarantee you I was not like that. I had to learn to make sacrifices of righteousness and put my trust in the Lord. Psalm 20, verse 3, remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice. He says, see law, which means think about it. Remember all thy offerings. Let's say for your family. What he's actually, what I think he's asking, well, here's what I'm going to say he's asking you to do in this scenario. 
I think the Bible here is asking you to think, now what did you do for your family this week? What did you do? What did you do for God this week? What did you do for your church this week? What have you done for your neighbors? Let me, I make it a workplace, a work environment. There's always going to be some idiot that you got to work with that doesn't want to do anything. And somebody's got to take up the slack for them. I see y'all nodding your head. You know exactly who I'm talking about. Somebody don't do nothing. And you got to do it. Well, listen, do you like your job? You want to keep it? Do it. Do it. Make a sacrifice and do it. You say, well, the boss won't see me. You're supposed to get rewards in heaven, remember? Deuteronomy 17. Look at this one. Turn your Bible there. Deuteronomy 17, verse 1. Thou shalt not sacrifice unto the Lord thy God any bullock or sheep wherein is blemish or in any evil favoredness, for that is an abomination unto the Lord thy God. You know what, we, you know what got me think about this message, don't you? When we had Brother Sam here from India who told us that rich mafia people in India will buy children on the slave market, take them to a temple, give them to that temple, and in that temple those children are laid screaming alive on a fire so that the mafia guy who bought the kid can get away with his sins. That made me sick. Made me mad. Who's he sacrificing? He's not sacrificing himself. It cost him a few bucks. These kids are worthless over there. He probably bought him for 20 bucks. And then had some priest throw him on a roasting fire to scream in agony as he drove off in his limousine. That makes me mad. What kind of sacrifice was that to that guy? Nothing! He probably spent more money on that on his prostitutes than he did the sacrifices. So... When God said, if you're going to bring a sacrifice to me, do not bring in your sick ones, your ones with sores all over them, because the ticks have been at them, because other things have been biting holes in them, or because they've got some disease and they've got... They've got sores all over them. God says, do you think I want that? God, God won't take it. And by the way, when it comes for you to do something for somebody, whether it's your husband, your wife, your family, don't give them the worst. You give them your best. And you do it every time. Well, they, you just don't understand, preacher. They don't appreciate me. We're supposed to be laying up treasures where? God will write every one of them down. And I promise you, He'll reward you. And it'll be far better than any reward that you could ever get down here. Hosea chapter 8. They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifice of mine offerings and eat it. 
but the Lord accepteth them not. Let, now, let, let me explain that. Turn, um, before you turn to Hosea, turn to 1 Samuel 2. I'm going to give you an explanation of that. See, I told you I wouldn't let you out at 12. But this means something. 1 Samuel, let me tell you why Eli lost his job. Let me tell you why Samuel took over Eli's job. Eli was the high priest. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Eli was the high priest. And he knew, listen to this, he knew his sons were doing this and he refused to do anything about it. By the way, Samuel ended up the same way. Samuel's two boys cost Samuel his ministry. The Bible says, now the son of, 1 Samuel 2, 12. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. You know what that means? They weren't even saved. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. Three teeth. Anytime I see three, I see lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Every time. And he struck it in the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot and all that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. And also before the burnt, they burnt the fat, the priest servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore, the sin of the young man was very great before the Lord, and for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Now let me explain what this means. When God sectioned out the Levite priest, all of the animal offerings and all of the wheat and oil offerings that came in every day, God, God wrote it in the law that a portion of every ox, goat, sheep, lamb, flour, oil, spices, everything that came in, God had a pre-written portion of every bit of it that was taken and set aside for the Levite priest. Why? God wouldn't allow them to have any land for them to have any cattle of their own. They couldn't grow their own, their own corn. They couldn't raise, they could not work another job. So God provided for the Levites and provided for them well. Do you know what Hophni and Phinehas were doing? They were taking what they wanted. Out of, that's what that flesh hook was. Flesh hook of three, three prongs. They would stick the flesh hook in while the, the sacrifice was seething in the pot and pull out. And whatever pulled out, they kept it. And then when the raw meat came in, they went and they cut off whatever portion they wanted and stole it from God. And if anybody said, uh, excuse me, you're not supposed to have that portion. That portion belongs to God. He would threaten him. He'd pull a knife on him and say, what'd you say to me, boy? Don't you know who my daddy is? My daddy's Eli. You're going to lose your job. They would use force and threaten that man. And they would steal whatever they wanted. We're talking about the men of God. God ended up killing them both. He ended up killing their dad for it too. So you know what happened? People stopped bringing sacrifices to the house of God, Brother George. Because they said, watch this now. All them priests down there at that temple, all they care about is stealing whatever I got anyway, so why should I even bother going? And isn't that... What 90% of America thinks about most of the churches in this country. Joel Osteen. Who's robbing and stealing churches blind. And so people say, 
I'm not going down to nobody's church. Them men, all they do is want money anyway. This Bible's still right. It's thousands of years old, and it's still right. So you know what I'm saying to you in this part? If it belongs to God, and you didn't give it to God, what did you do? Stole it. See, so you, don't, you don't believe that? Turn to Malachi. Malachi. Where am I looking for? I miss this verse every time. Where is it? Will a man rob God? Huh? 310. 310. I thought I had I thought I had chapter four pulled up. Here it is. Verse eight. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but you say, Wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? Bottom line is, and this this will apply to anybody, your family, your neighbors, your country. You say, Pastor, what do you say your country? If you're supposed to pay taxes on it, pay taxes on it. Boy, that's a touchy subject, isn't it? But render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and render unto God what belongs to God. Will a man rob God? Yes. Will a man rob his own family? Sure he will. You know, I changed the... The, the wedding thing that I read from, I found this one on the internet and I really liked it. And it had a portion in there that was written for, for both people in the family, the man and the woman. And it said, the gift without the giver is bare. Which means, if all you do is work and work and work and you make a bunch of money and you think that your family satisfied just by getting the, the gifts and the stuff from your money, they would rather have you than your gifts. Am I right? In Ezekiel chapter, I'm almost done. Ezekiel 34, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Shepherd could be you, me. You could apply it in every area of life where you could be doing something for somebody and you're not. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and you clothe you with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. The disease have you not strengthened? Neither have you healed that which was sick. Neither have you bound up that which was broken. Neither have you brought again that which was driven away. Neither have you sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd and became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep were... Let me tell you, let me tell you what happens. Can I say this? Can I tell you what happens in a family that gets busted up? Now I know we have some single parent families in this church. And I don't want you to think that I'm beating up on you. What I'm giving you is a warning. What happens to most families in Jefferson County when the woman has one, two, three kids and the dads have run off? Now she's got another man living in that house with those kids. What's happening in that house? God only knows. See what I'm saying? You're supposed to, as parents, 
You're supposed to protect that flock. Whether you have to do it on your own or you have help. But you better protect that flock. At all costs. Amen? Because the wolves are out there looking for your kids. Well, I better be about done. First Samuel 15, And Samuel saith, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. The, the greatest thing that you can do as a sacrifice to God is spend a portion of your day here. Amen? The greatest thing that I can do, in fact, what I'm supposed to do for this church is spend my time here so that I can keep giving you messages and messages and messages seven a week. At least I tried to record a watchman the other day and all I could do was cry because it was about tribulation and I'm going through it. It's your responsibility to sacrifice your time to spend in this book. And then God will take care of all the other sacrifices that you can make. He'll show you what he wants you to do. Can I get an amen out of somebody on that one? Till we leave on each other on good terms. Read that book and believe it. Because to obey it is better than all the sacrifices.